Hello and welcome to the Legal Eagle. My guest on the show today is someone who's been the youngest advocate general in the history of India at the age of 36. He's four times been advocate general in Goa. Former additional solicitor general in the Supreme Court, senior advocate, I welcome on the show Mr. Atmaram Nadkarni. Sir, as I welcome you on the show and I thank you for taking our precious time, I begin at the very start, those days when you've done your schooling, your college, even your law degree from Goa, you then went to Bombay where you did masters in constitutional and criminal law. You also secured a gold medal in Indian constitutional law where you got the highest marks. Tell us a bit about those years and what drove you. I'm one of those students who has learned and done my primary education through those petrol lamps, you know, the petrol max and all those things. There's no electricity at that time. And... Uh, we had to study virtually on those lamps. College education, I did my BA in entire economics. And I wanted to be a lawyer right from, my, from the beginning. Essentially, my parents, my mother wanted me to be a lawyer. She had always said that I should be a lawyer. And I believe she said that because uh, my family used to believe a lot in astrology and all that. And some astrologer had said that he will do well if he becomes a lawyer. So that's how I took up law as a profession. I did my LLB from a college in Goa. When I did my LLB, there was no system where you could go and do internship and all that, which we they do today. And after completing my LLB, I went to Bombay for doing my LLM. Throughout my education has been with the Bombay University because till I passed out LLB. There was no university in Goa. And in 86, I went to Bombay to do my LLM. And I did my LLM in uh, criminal law and uh, Indian and constitutional law. So that was the journey. And while doing LLM, yes. I was also practicing in Bombay High Court. At the age of 36, you are first time appointed Advocate General. This is something that you're appointed four times, which is exceptional. First time you're appointed for a year in 1999, then reappointed for five years from 2000 to 2005, then in 2012 for three years, and then reappointed in 2015 for one additional year. This shows, sir, that you have a deep understanding of politics and law. What does an advocate general as a law officer have to bear in mind, keeping in track that you have this track record, which is extremely remarkable, and how has Goa shaped over the years according to what you think? The role of an Advocate General under the Constitution, he is essentially the Advocate General for the state. He represents and is supposed to protect the interest of the state and the people of the state. He is the first law officer in the state, like the Attorney General is at the central level. Every state has an Advocate General. It's a post of Carry, which carries a lot of responsibility. And especially in a place like Goa, which is too small a place, and where you get immediately exposed if the talent is not there. I had never become a government advocate or additional government advocate or additional AG or anything like that. I had directly become advocate general at the age of 36, as you mentioned. And that's because the then Chief Minister, Mr. Sardina, called me up and he said, look, I want you to be my Advocate General. And that is how I took up the post of Advocate General. It was on 29th November 1999 that I took over as the Advocate General of the State of Goa for the first time. <laughs> Went on for another one year because after one year that government fell. So when the chief minister, you know, resigns, the convention is the advocate general also goes and resigns, which I did. And uh, then Mr. Manor Parikar became the chief minister of the state. And after Mr. Manor Parikar became the chief minister of state, he again invited me to be the advocate general. And that's how I was reappointed as the advocate general, which I continued till about 2005. But I must tell you, whether it be during the period of Mr. Sardina or Mr. Manohar Parikar, under whom I had the longest tenure as Advocate General, 
or thereafter mr parsekar who was there for about a year under whom i was there for a year all three chief ministers respected the letter of law even if they had a particular view and when i told them that this is the legal position they would respect that and go in accordance with the legal opinion it was of course a lot of responsibility Amazing. it has lot of pressure of work because the advocate general also appears in matters for the state government in the state of goa and there were several challenging matters also at that time several state legislations were challenged there was dissolution of the legislative assembly where i was the only advocate general standing against the stalwarts from delhi including the present learned attorney general mr k k venugopal so you know there were a lot of lawyers coming from delhi and that's all a political fight but in all this in all this process i had kept myself completely aloof from politics i want to take take it further you became a senior advocate in 2008 you also moved to delhi later on where you became the former where you became i beg your pardon the uh, additional solicitor general in india and a post for which you were there for 4 years you've now got experience as a law officer in the state of goa and as a additional solicitor general in the state in the supreme court representing the indian government how different are the two posts what were the most challenging times in these cases and the stuff and the cases that you did at this time firstly in so far as advocate general is concerned it is concerning the state the governance in the state and the activities of the state government and invariably and mostly it is at the high court level occasionally i used to go to supreme court to argue matters as advocate general goa in so far as the additional solicitor general is concerned the vista is completely different it is at the union level it's basically an all india sphere of operation and it's in supreme court so there's a lot of difference though supreme court and high court are both constitutional courts there is a subtle difference between the two and the difference is not only in matters of law factual aspects etc even the kind of preparation the kind of exposure mm. which you get in either of this post is completely different but i must tell you i enjoyed my tenure as advocate general as well as additional solicitor general and i consider not as my achievement or that i deserved it so i got it i consider it to be a grace of the god god has been very kind and therefore i got this one thing i refused to do as ag or asg to be a puppet of the government and to if i found that a particular order passed by the government was wrong even as ag or asg i have said that it's wrong and i have told the judges that you please uh, you know caution set aside this mr nathkarni on 9th of march 2012 manohar parikar was sworn in as the chief minister in goa one of the first decisions i would say the first decision he did is to appoint you as advocate general of goa on that very day in the first cabinet meeting in 2015 you were opposed you held till 2015 when he resigned from being chief minister you also resigned he had become the raksha mantri it's evident both of you had a very close bond what were those years in goa like and what do you miss most about him well in so far as mr manohar parikar is concerned apart from being a good friend one of the qualities of that man was he was a man of complete integrity unlike the politicians you see of today and i don't think there were any allegations or accusations across india he was known to be a very forthright politician and a man of integrity one of his qualities was he wanted himself to learn so he would come to me and discuss matters on law like he would say that you know i want a particular scheme or a particular law to be done and then law department would point out something many others would point out something i would point out and he would understand that 
So his governance was all people-centric governance. And he had the highest respect for law. He had himself been a great user of the Right to Information Act when he was in opposition. He had himself filed public interest litigations. It's a very celebrated judgment in the Supreme Court, Manohar Parikar versus State of Goa on the electricity matter. And therefore, my bonding was essentially because I respected the man and the quality, apart from the thing that our wavelengths matched, our principles matched, many things matched. People of Goa, people across India have been saying that this is the time when Mr. Manohar Parikar was required. Unfortunately, your channel did the program and rhythm. You conducted that show where they showed what is the situation and the state of affairs in the state of Goa. Such a tiny state and not being managed. People dying at the Goa Medical College because of lack of oxygen. And you tell the High Court that there was nobody to turn that tractor, there was no driver. If Mr. Manwar Parikar was there, I'm sure the things and the state of affairs would not have been what it is today. Across the country, COVID cases are rising. You are in Goa. You are seeing what's happening there. As someone who's been a part and a law officer in the state for the maximum time, how should this be tackled? Everywhere in the country, it was said that there is going to be a wave, second wave. You know, the medical experts had been warning it. But it's most unfortunate, I mean, it was not heeded to by people in power. I'm not saying that you can only blame the chief minister of a state or the prime minister of the country. Everybody has to take responsibility because people also were going out without masks. They were not maintaining uh, social distancing or COVID protocol when they went out. But equally to be blamed are the persons holding authority and governing the state and the country. So, of course, I don't believe in singling out people and just, you know, blaming everybody. But there's no point in doing that. It's not, it's not uh, something which they have manifested. It has happened. It's a nature's thing which has happened. But then it should have been controlled. And what I blame the authorities for, surely, is the lack of health facilities. In Delhi or in Goa, you know, the hospitals which were set up during the first wave were disbanded. You know very well that this is a thing where you need oxygen. Oxygen supply had to be kept ready. You had to see this. And now the experts are saying that there is going to be a third wave, which is going to hit, you know, younger generation, especially children. And I believe, I read it somewhere. Somebody saying in Goa that they have now made provision in Goa Medical College for 60 beds. I mean, for God's sake, if such a COVID situation hits the younger generation and children, you will at least require 10,000 beds. 60 beds are of what use. So it is high time that people in power, you know, they must realize one thing. They have got power to serve the people. It's a different thing that you make hay while the sun shines and do all your other extraneous things. For, that's for God and law of karma to take care of it. But at least do proper service. Don't allow people to die. I mean, the Madras High Court rightly observed, if you ask me, and told the election commission that, you know, we should charge you for a very serious offense. I also want to ask you about another very famous case that's been handled at the courts in Goa since I think around 2015. This is the Tarun Tejpal judgment. We've seen Tarun Tejpal, the sexual harassment case, started in 2013 and it became a rape case. It was called the Tarun Tejpal rape case. The Goa court came out with a judgment, 500 pages exonerating him. It's now been challenged by the government of Goa in the Bombay High Court. The Goa government has said that it's important for women all over to know that immediately cognizance was taken. What are your views on the Tejpal judgment? See, uh, very frankly, I haven't read the whole judgment. But at the outset, I must tell you, yes. I'm told that there are 
certain portions in the judgment which identify the prosecutrix. If this be so, it's a very serious matter. The Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court and the High Court judges must take a very serious view of it. The law provides that you should never identify the person, the, 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 uh, the victim. The victim's identity should never be disclosed. And I happen to read it somewhere in some public media that the High Court has directed that this portion should be effaced. It was a bench of Justice Madan and Justice Deepak Gupta. There are judgments, there are orders which are passed. And the order saying that you shall never disclose the identity of the uh, girl. So, number two about prosecution. I am told the judges pointed out many flaws in the prosecution case. One doesn't know what exactly has happened. Because so long as Mr. Parikar was there that time in 2012 to 15 and thereafter Mr. Parikar, the case was going on okay. I believe, I don't know really what has happened. Till then the trial had not started. I believe it has started thereafter. And I mean, frankly, I don't know, but things don't look completely okay the way they have happened. Because the girl's statement was recorded under 164. There were other statements recorded. But I read in the newspaper saying that the judgment says that you have not attached this, you have not attached the, uh, the video clipping from the hotel and all that. If that be so, it's a very glaring thing. But one doesn't know a proper inquiry will have to be held to find out where and what thing has gone wrong. These are, you know, rhythm high-profile cases. And in high-profile cases, yes. there are all sorts of attempts which are done. Always. So whether it is the prosecution or the police or everybody, one has to be on their guards and toes and defend it properly. Uh, there is a certain lobby that has always time and again tried to besmirch the judiciary. Whether it's the Rafal case, whether it's the impeachment of a former Chief Justice of India, whether there are spurious allegations to be made against a Chief Justice, whether it is the Ayodhya case, there is a lobby that always tries to intimidate the judiciary. And you've come out and spoken against the lobby, calling a spade a spade. But what is your message to the lobby? And also, what are the steps that need to be taken to ensure that this lobby, this gang of people, is not always ready to attack? Uh, you know, you are absolutely right that there are certain times and off late, especially judiciary has come under attack. If you see Twitter, if you see WhatsApp groups, even newspapers, magazines, so many things are written about judiciary and judges. There is no harm in criticizing a particular judgment. Even if Supreme Court delivers a judgment tomorrow, you can criticize and say that this judgment is wrong. But you can't attribute something to the Supreme Court or the judges when you are crossing the Lakshman Rekha. And I think many of us at many a times have crossed Lakshman Rekha. Maybe in a given case, the criticism was justified. And there was some substance. The issues were right also. But even if that be so, there are ways and means of doing it. There are ways and means of raising the issue. That there is a normal tendency to embarrass people holding high positions in life. But in the process, we are tarnishing the image of the judiciary en masse. Don't do it because judiciary is the institution where people run to. Look at the violence in West Bengal. Everybody has run to now Supreme Court or the High Court. If there is a misuse by the government of any of its powers, you run to the judiciary. Our Supreme Court, our High Court have stood the test of time. They have done a yeoman job. And if you simply criticize it, then India's image abroad also gets affected. And there is no point, you know, in cutting the tree on which you are sitting. So this lobby at certain point of time must also understand that too much criticism of the judiciary which they do 
and unless it is well meaning and within the limits and raised in a proper manner proper fora and in the proper way it should be you are likely to drive people to lose faith in the administration of justice and if that happens then you know how things happen in some panchayats etc they open their own law court so we can't afford to have that system you've done a very important case for the goa children's act which was upheld there were a lot of pressure to try and to dilute it however it was upheld in its present form the juvenile justice act is something we've seen the entire nation going to in horror and shock against when it came to the nirbhaya case how should similar acts such as the goa child's act be seen at the state at the central level You know the Goa Children Act was enacted when Mr. Parikar was the Chief Minister, and because it was the International Year of the Child, the thinking was, and there were certain good officials in the Goa government at that time, some IAS officers, secretaries, etc., and they did a very good job of you know compiling all that, and finally it had to be put in the legal format which we do. if you see the provisions of the goa children act those provisions i wish and pray should be incorporated in the juvenile justice act the provisions are so stringent and are actually meant to give justice to the children i mean when you deal with children it is not that you know everybody is born with a silver spoon in their mouth but ultimately children are children and you got to protect them and in goa you know there is a separate act which is done it is a public service act which also mr parikar enacted if modi really intends to do good governance in this country he should take the provisions of that particular act and apply and enact that particular act in so far as whole of india is concerned i'll tell you rhythm in short what the act is apart from children that act says a uh, guarantee to citizens of services firstly that act provides for special privileges for children and women to in this country you know controls breed corruption you go and apply for any permission anywhere people don't get that permission if you want to build a house you got to take about 18 or 20 permissions by the time you get that permission you're tired same thing the business community is facing and each of these permissions except for few baby you need to do palm grazing it is a fact that in india corruption has not been eradicated on the contrary it is growing and if you want to arrest this and during mr parikar's time we had done this the act has got provision such as you know if a permission is applied for the secretary or the official dealing with it has to dispose of the file within a period of 7 days if it goes to the minister he has to dispose it of within 10 days further another 10 days but within a period of one month the citizen must get a response whether it is granted or rejected because if you sit on it then there are chances that you can generate all kind of other things on it so if we realize that control breeds corruption and if you i'm not saying you loosen all the controls but you regulate this particular controls and the manner in which the authority exercises its powers what are you passionate about other than the law we know you're extremely fond of doing yoga and passionate about badminton sir i practice yoga because <laughs> yoga is a science not only dealing with body physical exercise but uh, it makes you mentally strong and in the profession of law you got to be mentally strong your mind apart from being sound has to be very stable and calm because that time you you got to think on your feet in the law courts see i have a passion for badminton because that's the game i love i love playing badminton i love swimming 
I love going for mountaineering tracks. I love even adventurous trips in the forest, etc. So, I mean, those were my those are my passions. So, but I do, of course, reading and other things which a lawyer is bound to do. Lawyers are supposed to be truthful. Something that we're not seeing. So, for a very enlightening, how the law needs to really function. We thank you for being a part of the Legal Eagle this week. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.